Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's program. This is the second of three archival events. Today's program is Artists and Archives. Uh, my name is Donna Gustafson. I'm the interim director and the curator for American art at the Zimmerly Art Museum on the New Brunswick campus, Rutgers University. Um, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that Rutgers University is located on the ancestral lands of the still living, still sovereign Muncie Lenape people. We honor the Muncie Lenape and the many and diverse Native American indigenous peoples who call this region home, past, present, and future. Along with my colleague, Professor Jerry Began of the Department of Art and Design at Rutgers, um, I co-curated the exhibition, Angela Davis Sees the Time, which is on view at the Zimmerly Art Museum through June 15th, 2022. It will travel to the Oakland Museum of California and be on view there from October 8th, 2022 to June 11th, 2023. Please see um, each museum's website for further details of the exhibition and future programming. Angela Davis Sees the Time is centered on a rich archive of material, including magazines, posters, booklets, flyers, records, legal documents, and court sketches collected by the Oakland-based archivist and activist Lisbeth Tellefson. This material is intertwined with works of art that speak to Angela Davis's historical impact and continued importance in radical intersectional thought and her activism around prison abolition. This productive tension, this movement backwards and forwards between past and present and between historical document and art troubles our ideas around archives and history. Three archival events. was organized by Jerry Began as a celebration of the archive and the exhibition. While our exhibition is a starting point, these three conversations about archives in history, art, and sound encompass a wide net. We hope that these discussions will inspire individuals and groups to activate existing archives and also spur memory work within local communities. Today's subject is artists and archives. On Thursday, October 28th at 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will present Archiving the Invisible, Black Sonic Archives. You will need to register separately for, for that um, session. Before I hand over the event to our moderator, Dayan Huff, I would like to thank our donors. Uh, this program is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. Grant funding has also been provided by the Middlesex County Board of County Commissioners through a grant award from the Middlesex County Cultural and Arts Trust Fund. The event is being recorded and will be shared on the, on the Zimmerly's YouTube channel. Our moderator, Dayan, will be fielding questions. So please submit any questions for the panel using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We will get to as many of your questions as we can. Thank you, Jerry Began, for organizing these exciting panels. Thank you to our Curator of Education, Amanda Potter, for her work tonight, today in support of the event. And thank you to Dayan Huff, our moderator. Dayan is the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And she also was an advisor on our exhibition project and programming. So thank you, Dayan. Thank you, Donna, Jerry, and the entire Zimmerly staff running back end, as well as to all those team members who made this program and this three-part series possible. I also like to thank everyone who is in attendance today. We are representing coast to coast as well as across the Atlantic Ocean today um, with our panelists. Um, I feel truly honored and grateful to be holding and sharing space today with this truly astonishing trio of artists. Um, to offer you flow, um, the program will be broken up into three parts. Stady, Bethany, and Stephanie in that order will offer roughly 10 minute presentations of bodies of work connected to archives. We'll then come together for a group conversation and finally open things up as Donna mentioned to audience questions. So over the course of the program, if thoughts come to mind, please put them in the chat. And you know, as, as it makes sense, I might also just fold them into the questions that I'm asking. 
But before I invite Sadie to get us started, I'd like to do some framing, one frame amongst many. And mine is around the use of language, which is a central element at play in the practices of all three of our artists, as well as when we consider the role of an archive where a construction, deconstruction, or reconstruction of language is necessary to communicate an idea, a history, a story, a life. So as I was taking notes in preparation for this conversation, many of the words that came to mind or I found myself writing as I was thinking about an archive, the archive, our archive, began with re or re or ra, depending on how you're pronouncing it. Remix, repair, restore, revive, revise, recover, remember, repeat, rememory, reimagine, reclaim, redact, repress, residue, remains, repository, reorder, reference, recuperation, recreation. And re, according to Merriam-Webster, we're getting into process, is one, a noun, the second note of the major scale, so a tone, uh, two, a prefix, meaning again, a new, but also back, backward, so a pacing, and three, a preposition, meaning with regard to, so a direction. So perhaps we could consider an archive a movement, a motion, always straddling worlds, time, spaces, past, present, and future. The scales are backwards and forwards, the vinyl turn clockwise and counterclockwise. The archive is a body, a multitude of bodies, as body, as a life, as lives that we aim to revive. We're in a moment, this unprecedented moment where we are now continually requesting, desiring a return to a coming back while simultaneously needing to look forward to believe in a new tomorrow. So the big question is, what is the space between that we are, will, neglect, omit? What is the archive for what we immediately want to forget? So we'll come back to some of these thoughts later, but now I'd like to invite Sadie to get us started. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you so much for having me in this space and in this wonderful company um, to talk about and celebrate this amazing exhibition. Um, as always, I'd like to thank those that came before me both on this land and in my profession. There's a lot of shoulders that I stand on, um, as well as my ancestors and my family. And I just really quickly also want to thank Lisbeth Tellefson for this amazing, amazing archival work. Um, I'm lucky enough to have Lisbeth as a colleague and a friend, and I've been able to visit the archive um, that has, you know, grown and been taken such care of over such a long period of time. And it, to me, it's really a reminder that you know, the practice of archiving is not necessarily like just this clinical process, but can actually be one of deep, deep love and passion and of course, deeply, you know, political as well. So just want to say huge thanks and congratulations to Elizabeth for this amazing accomplishment. And I am going to share my screen. I am also going to try to keep this, you know, right on time respect everyone's digital attention span and, you know, get to the part where we all get to speak together. Um, but I will also try not to talk too fast, but I do want to, oh, sorry about that. I do want to introduce um, a couple of projects and just take you through, you know, my thinking and working with the archive. Um, so the project that I will first talk about, um, it really has to do with family, with love, with the systems that we live under, but also what's possible beyond those systems. So I have been working on this project for a few years now, and it uses as source material, a 500 page FBI surveillance file amassed on my father. During his time with the Black Panthers in Los Angeles, he founded the Compton chapter of the Black Panthers in 1968 as well as his time in the Bay Area working with Angela Davis um, during her trial for freedom. And, you know, I think thinking about this, you know, government archive, it's kind of one of those quintessential things when we think of an archive, it has this alleged authority. It has what I like to call a truthiness in the way that the kind of black and white officious documents read. But as we know, it's riddled with lies, with violence, and with bias. And so my 
project has really been to try and reclaim this material, try and trouble and disturb this authority and um, to, you know, essentially make these files live in my world, make them do something else, make them honor my father and his story, which is also a story of so many other families um, in this country. And I think it was both a, you know, it was a selfish project and that I needed to do this. I needed to do something to these files. And it's a project that I hope, you know, others can see their own history reflected in as well. So um, as you can see, this um, is kind of the title header page of this FBI file. Um, it says right there on the front, you know, do not destroy historical values, national archives. So there's a lot of different kind of moments and points of entry um, when, you know, even thinking about why this information is saved and collected. But just to give you a sense of context, um, this is an exhibition that is actually currently on view if you happen to be in California. And it's the most recent iteration of the project. I've spent a lot of time listening to the source material, you know, watching people react to the works and have really scaled up. And so right now I am doing the format that this work is mostly taking is these large graph, large scale graphite drawings, which you'll also see um, at, on exhibition at the Zimmerly. And they are 60 inches high by 48 inches wide, powdered graphite on stark white paper. And I will run you through a few details and examples of the particular works. So obviously I've inverted, you know, the documents where instead of black text on white, I've inverted it to kind of bring an even more ghostly quality to further transmute the original intent of why the information was being amassed and collected in the first place. And to make these works with graphite by hand, you know, what is what happens when you copy something almost verbatim by hand and what you know, comes through that process. It's a really slow process and it gives me time to meditate on, you know, the bravery, the politic, the real life people who are involved. Um, and this particular drawing is called informants. And these boxes are redactions essentially listing informants. Um, you know, Betty Medsker, who has an amazing book about kind of the discovery of COINTELPRO and how that happened, um, which was citizens broke into an FBI office. Um, exposed COINTELPRO, but basically she says that, you know, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover thought of Black Americans as falling into two categories, um, those who should be surveilled and those who should be used to spy on other Black Americans. Um, you can see I'm also using spray paint, so I'm thinking here about my generation as like a 80s baby and graffiti and tagging and how that's used to kind of claim space, mark that, you know, we were here and thinking of pink as something that would perhaps um, destabilize, you know, J. Edgar Hoover the most, and the thing that would be the most kind of violating of this weaponized bureaucracy would be this splash of pink. Um, I'm also using roses. So thinking specifically about roses as um, ways that we honor, we mourn, memorialize, ways that we take care of each other. We give each other flowers when we're down or to say, I love you. Um, so thinking about this organic material, again, encroaching on these files. Um, this text, you know, is rather short, but pretty chilling in the, the way that it kind of captures an amber this moment, um, almost like a, a photograph. And I am going to try to run through these fairly quickly. And um, this particular page is called Black Community News, this drawing, and it's documenting the passing around within FBI offices of the Black Panther newspaper. So thinking about how, um, you know, even culture and literature and um, information sharing was, you know, considered dangerous. And I've got these Hello Kitties, um, again, kind of infiltrating this, this document, buzzing around. I think of them as like this little people's army and also thinking about the, fa the sort of father-daughter conversation and young children, you know, protecting their parents in this retroactive way. At other moments, the roses function more as like a wallpaper or a domestic reference. Here, it's almost looking like a faded wallpaper. 
And you can see this page is just entirely redactions. So sometimes the information that's not there tells you just as much um, as what is. And of course, I think thinking about archives, um, thinking about photography and the way a mugshot functions, you know, necessarily to dehumanize um, someone. And again, trying to transmute this from being a mugshot to actually being a portrait of a father and a community activist and someone who dared to, you know, challenge the st structures and systems of oppression. There's a detail. Um, I'm not going to go super in depth into this, but you can see on the left, it's my father in an army uniform and in the right, um, what we think of as like a panther uniform and surrounded by this wallpaper. And here's a detail of the wallpaper. And then I just very quickly want to mention an a project that is also an archive in a very different way. So this is the Eagle Creek, um, the new Eagle Creek Saloon, which pays tribute to my father's bar, which was the first and maybe the last black owned gay bar in San Francisco. And there was no real archival information about it. So we had to create an archive and it's a living archive. It's a project that you are meant to visit and attend and throw drinks around and talk about the legacy of my father's bar and also build new community space. And so very much refusing the idea that the archive is you know, static and um, can only be displayed in one, one way and really trying to elevate you know, oral histories as archival as well. And then there is of course a zine that I made to accompany it so that that information can travel in multiple ways. And I'm going to encourage people to follow along with this Eagle Creek project now that things are opening up a bit more. Um, I hope that it will travel soon. So feel free to keep in touch and hopefully we can um, have a glass at some point together. And I will leave it there and thank you so much. Thank you, Sadie, so much for that. Um, and now I welcome Bethany to join us. Hi, it's nice to be with you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I put my AirPods in. Okay, so I'll share my screen and talk a little bit about the work as well. It's nice to follow Sadie um, and to join you all this morning. So I wanted to share with you some, um, some new bodies of work, all that came after 2016. So one of the first, all of the work deals with language. Um, I, I have a kind of love of language, but it's a two-sided love. Um, on one side is this idea that, you know, if we, if we have the same words, then there's nothing that we cannot communicate about and make sense of and understand one another. And on the flip side, uh, because language is an extension of us, it is bound to fail and it fails and falls apart in all these different ways. And language is always, it always has that um, two sides of the coin. So one of the first works that I made after the 2016 presidential election was both the series and the show and then also America Hymnal, which is made up of a hundred contrafactum. These are songs that retain their melody that stays consistent, but then the lyrics are rewritten over time for different social political causes. So in my country, tis of thee, the melody is actually the same as six other national anthems, including ours. The version we know is written in 1831, sung in uh, Boston by a children's choir for the first time. But then it gets rewritten both before and after this moment for um, there are suffrage versions, labor, lots of temperance and prohibitionist versions of my country to be. The Confederacy has their versions as do abolitionist and the Union Army. They are always, the most interesting ones are in contradiction to one another. It is a hundred dissenting versions of then what does it mean to belong to this place and to belong together? And they are not in agreement. Those 100 versions are bound within the same hymnal, but then the musical notes, that consistent melody is burned away while those 100 dissenting versions or voices remain legible and constant. It's also really interesting once the text is closed for a long time to reopen it again and actually sift through the pages, that that burning smell, which initially is like a, it's very comforting, like a campfire, it turns acrid and it's unpleasant. And the pages start to cling together and they aid in their own destruction. That the more you read the hymnal and participate in this idea of, of democracy, or American history that it, the, the piece falls apart and gets more and becomes more and more complicated. 
The sense of song, though, is pretty constant um, since the hymnal in different ways, where this idea of a kind of repeating chorus throughout history has been a constant for a while now in my practice. So these works are based on, um, Edie Hirsch wrote a book, I think it's 18, 1987, called Cultural Literacy, Things Every American Should Know, national bestseller, New York Times bestseller. And in the back of the list, there's um, an index of 5,000 things that according to Hirsch, if we know these things, then we will all feel like we belong together in this shared space as Americans. But it's, a, it's one man's list, right? And so there's things left out. But included in that list are nine patriotic songs. And so for this Red Noise series or Red Panel series, I made um, a painting for each of those patriotic songs. And then what's being, what looks like on top of these like tiny letters, snowflakes, land masses, they read in kind of different ways, is actually um, a lyric from each of those nine patriotic songs that for me feels like it belongs in a love song versus nationalistic, you know, patriotic anthem. So this lyric that's pulled from my country, Tis of Thee, is Thy Name I Love. And that's rewritten over and over again until it becomes illegible noise, illegible unsingable noise. After the first red, which is also the red of the hymnal, every other painting in the series falls darker into shadow until it's the amazing grace, um, which is almost, it's purple and almost, um, the red is almost illegible. The lyric that's been rewritten here is Who More Than Self from the song America the Beautiful. And then just to give you a sense of the text, uh, a detailed image of the work, the song here is This Is My Country. And the lyric that's being rewritten is to have and to hold over and over again. So not only does the red change, but the white text from that first piece from My Country to Zippy, which references then white noise, like TV static, shifts to black charcoal. And black noise is actually pure silence, right? These all these wavelengths of noise. Blue noise sounds like an egg in a frying pan. Red noise or brownian noise people tend to listen to to fall asleep at night. It's more like a waterfall. Black noise is pure silence. So the song that cannot be sung, it's illegible and unsingable, and then cannot make us feel like we belong together in this space. And the last one, I am for you from You're a Grand Old Flag. It's also interesting about Hirsch is he includes a couple of songs that don't have any love language in them, within them. And then he doesn't include a couple of songs that it feels like should be on the list. And so there's a couple of works in this series that are um, my collaboration with Hirsch changing that idea of the index of 5,000 things, his 5,000 things. This though is the work in the show or works from this series or um, in the show Seize the Time. So this series or this um, larger installation of work is called the Birmingham News from 1963. So I'm originally from Alabama, 1963, Birmingham. Um, the Birmingham News editorial board makes a decision not to publish any civil rights stories on their cover pages. This is the height of the spring campaign. Um, when you see these iconic images in many of the other national papers, even the Montgomery Advertiser, I think where I am from, above the fold, multiple photographs, now iconic images of police dogs and fire hoses, children being arrested, filling the jails, filling Birmingham jails. But because the editorial board makes a decision not to cover these stories that are happening a couple of blocks from the actual museum building, uh, headquarters. Instead, they report on Sophia Loren is sick in bed and can't get to her movie shoot. Uh, they send a reporter to the zoo, and there is a large photograph of a uh, top reporter of the Birmingham News holding a snake, and it's kind of uh, wrapped around his head. There's an entire above-the-fold front-page story about the, the reporter and the snake, instead of what's happening in that moment. So these are also works that I made right after the, a little bit after the election, right around the time that Kelly and Conway was talking about alternative facts. And this idea of can, can an institution, can the newspaper, can our authorities of truth, holders of truth actually be trusted? And that's the more, you know, there's this idea of the disintegration of the paper that the more you challenge the institution, it falls apart. That's part of it, but it's also that, you know, the institution, at least in this moment, wasn't covering the actual events of the day, or that the events were very, you know, it was a particular story they wanted to tell. 
when civil rights stories were actually covered in the newspaper, they would be buried inside second, maybe third page, and then reported very stenographically. So no, no actual um, interviews of people involved. The work is blind embossed. So that's um, sifting through the archive, looking for moments from 1963 during the spring campaign, particularly for moments when there should have been coverage of police violence against protesters not covered, and then pulling those pages, reprinting them backwards into an acrylic plate, soaking the paper, registering it, and running it through the press so that the that wet, malleable paper um, is forced into the grooves of the text. When you lift it up, it's like a braille, right? It's a printing of nothing, essentially. It's there and it's not there. That process is repeated twice, and that's when the paper starts to fall apart. It's that second time of repeating the mistakes of the past. The institution doesn't hold. And so they all fall apart in different ways. That process is pulled, I pulled that process into this work as well, but with a completely different archive. And this is the last work I wanted to, to mention for series. So these works are, um, Heather Williams has some wonderful scholarship uh, and a book called Help Me to Find My People. It talks about these classified ads placed by formerly enslaved people looking for their loved ones, right before the end of the Civil War, all the way up until the 1920s. Some people would post every year, became a kind of repetition, a kind of chorus of asking for help finding their loved ones. And others, you might see a kind of one-off classified ad with everything that you could remember about your loved one that might help you to be reunited. Uh, nicknames, names, nicknames, places where you last saw them. I last saw him in Mississippi. Um, any identifying marks, they become these little love letters to, to whom you lost. They were published in about, I think, six different African-American newspapers, and then they were often read from the pulpit. And so people would hear how others were asking for their loved ones, and that became another kind of choral refrain. Do you know them? Have you seen her? I last saw him in Mississippi. Will the ministers of the South please read this from your pulpit? Can you help me to find my people? This work I made after the family separation crisis at the border. And so that repetition of the process of blind embossing, the second time it doesn't hold up, the work starts to fall apart. They are both, you know, they're love letters, but they're incredibly, they're tragic, right? They're hard to read. What I like about this work, this is the last thing I'll say, is that actually it's not as fragile as it looks. That once the paper kind of re-solidifies, even with its tears and abrasions, and its deconstruction, it holds. It kind of becomes firm and showing its own history, it firms itself again, and they won't continue to fall apart. They're stronger than they look. So I'll, I'll release the floor so we can hear from Stephanie and looking forward to our, our conversation. Thank you so much, Bethany. And last but not least, I'd like to invite Stephanie to join us. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Dan, for hosting. Thank you, Donna and Jerry, for stewarding this project through so many um, complications and setbacks. Uh, it's been such a, such a pleasure as a professor at Rutgers and also as an artist to see this exhibition come together. Um, I am, so I'm, I'm not going to share my screen, I don't think. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is say a little bit about my work, uh, just sort of in general, and then share a portion of the sound from the installation um, by Justin Hicks and myself that is part of uh, Angela Davis' Use the Time, and then list a few questions relating to the, the, the kind of prompt that Dan um, provided for us today, the subject of archives and specifically archival repair. Um, so a series of questions that are connected to my work and connected to this piece. Um, so first I wanna say that, um, and this is something that I think Bethany and, um, Bethany and Sadie and I share, is that all of us have a, such a specific relationship to writing and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk more about that later. Um, I certainly personally come from a long line of writers. My family is made up of poets and librarians and preachers and activists. And I was trained as a writer before I um, started to exhibit my work in galleries and museums. So some of the central questions that interest me include, how do we learn? 
how do we communicate, for example, through writing? How do we use tools and instruments and technologies of writing and representation strategically? How do we remind ourselves of the opacities, the frictions that are always present in our attempts to connect with one another? And I understand opacity to mean everything that's present in us and our experiences that can't be translated into language. Um, at the same time, I'm very interested in thinking about alternatives to, to the art history that I personally inherited. So I think a lot about how we talk about performance, how we talk about drawing, um, how we talk about writing um, without passing through old masters or any masters, uh, what we can learn if we pay attention to vernacular cultural forms. And uh, as a result, I a lot of my work focuses on um, or begins by looking at places where deep cultural study and exchange happens. Um, for example, R&B music or slam poetry or the black church or circus traditions to uncover different models for understanding what art can be. Um, I think a lot about, and this is connected to some of the questions that I'm gonna ask later. Um, I think a lot about the deep aesthetic experiences that, every, that like all of us have in our everyday lives, um, like reading books or going to church or listening to music or watching street performance and how those can help us imagine new horizons for contemporary art. Okay, so enough of an introduction. Um, the um, excerpt that I'm gonna share today is from Black Gold 3. Um, it's the title of this piece. It's um, from a, um, a sculptural sound installation by Justin Hicks and myself. We perform as Microcosmos. It's like my band, <laughs> our side project. Um, it's um, the third uh, in a series of installations with sculpture and sound and um, the performer is the vocalist Jade Hicks, and I'll say maybe a few more things after after we listen. So we're going to listen for like three or four minutes. This is a quest we must begin. of Cook County, 500 East 51st Street in the city of Chicago, in the state of Illinois. Ha, <laughs> 
grew up at 6140 South Rose Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, in the neighborhood now called West Woodlawn. Street in Tryon, North Carolina. Grew up at 30 East Livingston Street in Tryon, North Carolina. Okay, so that was um, just hopefully everyone could hear that. Um, I, I hope you would have stopped me if you couldn't. <laughs> um, so that was just a few minutes from this work and I'll say a little bit about it. Um, one reason I wanted to share that is because I know that Bethany and um, Sadie have not been able to see the show yet. So they might not have experienced the work that's, or even the body of work that's, um, that's uh, represented in the exhibition. Um, so the um, but, um, as I mentioned, Black Gold Three is a part of um, a part of a collaborative project um, with Justin Hicks. The two of us perform as Microcosmos, and what you hear in that libretto are um, geographical locations associated with the three subjects of this work, uh, who are Lorraine Hansberry, Angela Davis, and Nina Simone. The um, the work draws its melody from the passage "Oh, what a lovely precious dream." in To Be Young, Gifted, and Black, and it moves through one pitch at a time, associating different octaves, um, octaves of the, of the, um, you know, of the keyboard um, with Lorraine, Angela, and Nina. So it's kind of a task-based performance. Um, there's a sense of experimentation. We're really experiencing Jade play um, as she develops fluency and explores the possibilities and also the limits of the score. And we hear that in particular um, when she's working at the edge of her range, uh, and also as she's kind of exploring methods for traveling from one octave to the next. So I made a lot of notes. I'm not going to be able to go through them all, um, but I'll just maybe mention a couple of things. Um, I personally, I think a lot about the relationship between the archive and liveness, um, the way that archival material is alive when it's accessed or when it's used. So I often work with my own body as a as a as a subject and with other bodies as well. And I think I think a lot of, um, in addition about how bodies can um, sort of function as archives that they contain the imprint of every movement, every action that they've experienced. Um, I have a little story that's not that relevant, but a little bit relevant. I'm in Lisbon right now um, installing an exhibition and I went today, I'm going to tell this in like 20 seconds. I went today to an adult gymnastics class, um, which is like my hobby. And this person in the course of this class, it was an hour long class, I learned, I did tumbling. This person taught me in, my coach for today taught me an entirely new way of making a twist, like a, a whole new way of making a twist something that I have, never, I have never experienced, never learned before in the US. And I was thinking about, as I was, as, I was, as I was learning this from him and thinking, oh, now this is something that I have that I want to be able to pass along. I was also thinking about how many um, 
how many teachers and teachers of, the, of those teachers and teachers of those teachers and teachers of those teachers had um, generated and passed along this knowledge, which is really only present in the body, like it only exists, um, and it only exists when, it, when, it's, when it's being activated, when it's being used, when it's being performed. That said, this, this kind of um, um, point about the um, relationship between archives and liveness, I don't think it's specific to body-based archives, although that's a kind of easy, like an easy way to see it. But I actually also think it's uh, absolutely the case for physical archives and repositories and collections and libraries as well. So um, in that sense, I guess I'm personally, I'm less interested in um, uh, archives or in knowledge as like static things that you build and more interested in knowing and learning and absorbing and um, all of the different tools and resources we have for prompting those activities. Like how do we prompt people to think about um, to think about learning together or knowing together. Um, how do we prompt them? How do we, how can we support and sustain those kinds of activities? Um, how do we, um, and how can we sort of activate them in an ongoing way? And in my own practice, um, both my collaborative work and, in, um, and also in my individual work, I, I think a lot about those questions. Um, I'm just going to make one other point from my list, um, which is that I, <laughs> I've spoken in the past sometimes about how archives have a logic that's kind of anticipatory. Um, that, and, I, and I think, um, I, you know, I've, I've, I often think about how one way to even define archive is um, like that which, that which awaits, that which awaits activation, that which awaits um, reviewing. Um, there's a way in which um, the archive always implies a future um, within which it, the objects that it um, that it that it protects will be available again, and also a future in which they matter. So objects in an archive are precious in part because it's expected that they will be precious in the future, and that. Um, relationship to um, anticipation. We often talk about archives as having to do with the past, but I actually think so much more about what archives imply about um, what we will need or what we will be able to use um, going forward. And um, I, yeah, um, I have this whole set of notes about unlearning, but maybe we'll get into that later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I would love for Bethany and Sadie to rejoin us. I have even more questions now. Um, so time feels so of the essence, but I just wanna thank each of you so much for such thoughtful presentations. Um, I'm gonna start, I will start with one question and then as, as it makes sense to go on tangents, I welcome them. Um, so I'll just go back to like the opening statement that I made as a jump off. So just thinking about the role of language and writing within your respective archival processes or your just creative practices um, and the decision to lean into that, especially thinking about maybe particular challenges of, of the black archive, thinking about legibility and illegibility and these the historical challenges of literacy for us and the importance of oral histories. And as Stephanie was mentioning, like this inheritance via the body. So um, if you want to start there, just thinking about the role of language and writing and these different forms of communication. Well, yes, can I, can I tie that back into something that Stephanie just said? Yeah. which is that the archive is about, like it's constantly looking at the, these materials of the past. There's my own love of language. It probably comes from growing up in the South and growing up in the church, but it also comes from, it's probably like a love of drama as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a dictionary from the 19, I think it's 1982, American Heritage, that mm -hmm. just like causes ripples, right? Lots of dictionary drama in the rest of the world. But the idea of... Um, a dictionary as an archive of our language in a moment. It's part of that. I think that's at the heart of my own practice, that there's a lot you can tell about who we are and what we value and what we don't value. Um, it's revealing that the language of our, of our time is incredibly revealing. So that kind of collection of all of our language in one place, it's such a tantalizing prospect. 
I think that's where my own love of language comes from. But back to what Stephanie was saying, this that archives are also about a, um, a belief in the future that I think they are about a faith in the future. I don't often think of them as like, what, what will we need then? But in this moment, it is worth, it's worth saving because I believe that there will be something to come. It does feel like a kind of proposition of faith. I'm using faith like really non-religiously here, a belief in a future, yeah. Sadie, Stephanie. Well, this is sort of related and unrelated and going back to that idea that Stephanie said, which I think is just maybe um, kind of sparking some excitement. So we're just <laughs> jumping around, but the idea that the archive is kind of half of the, you know, process and it's not completed until somebody revisits it and opens it up, dusts it off. Um, I really love that idea as, you know, thinking about it's sort of um, a dance or a choreography between, you know, the archive and someone who's, you know, receiving it. And I just love that as a more kind of active um, way of thinking about the kind of role and job and offering of, of the archive. I, um, my relationship, um, I have to like restrain myself. I, someone should cut me off um, after like a few 60 seconds or something because I could probably talk about this forever. Um, my, my relationship to writing is so complicated. And um, as you pointed out, Dan, um, there is um, one set of complications that has to do with the fact that writing is, it's like the medium of our education system. So um, learning how to, um, read and write in a normative way um, ends up be becoming almost impossible to separate from what it means, um, what it means to think, what it means to um, remember, um, what it means to plan uh, for the future, you know, what it means to reflect on the past. All, so, much, so much of um, our relationship to um, uh, um, the <laughs> so much of our relationship to everything really um, but so much of our like the for, kind of formalized relationship to the world is mediated by writing um, and the and the the this um, kind of thing that um, writing knowing how to write reading knowing how to read there's they're, they're um, all wrapped up in complex power relations um, so um, writing and reading have played such an important role in the history of black culture in the US um, it's 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 like it's impossible to talk about the 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 like the journey to freedom without talking about the a, a relationship to writing, um, but um, you know at the same time in the contemporary moment, reading, writing, and thinking are also like um, very complicated with one another. Um, sometimes I quote um, Ramosi, the 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 MC, um, once said, "Knowledge, knowledge is knowledge," um, which I sometimes quote. There's like this kind of circularity, this like feeling of redundancy sometimes that um, feels really important to acknowledge and um, really important to um, engage. Um, I also I also think um, that the you know in in terms of um, some like the, the the point that Bethany made about the relationship between the past and the present and the future being really slippery um, in really, um, um, as specified by writing. I think about that too, um, that there's a kind of magic to um, like a kind of time travel almost that's associated with reading, that's associated with writing, that's associated with this kind of anticip this anticipation of being read in the future. And that magic is something that um, is truly um, you know that I think that I that, it, that I think is, is is truly fascinating and it's just as much of a um, uh, like inspiration for for many artists as um, like a desire to draw or a desire to um, you know it's like a very particular kind of magic that's um, really intoxicating. Lots more, but I, I guess I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, unless Bethany, we. Were you gonna say something? No, I was gonna, I was thinking I hate writing. I have no love, like my love of language is not related to a love of writing. Um, I often think about this essay by Maggie Nelson where she talks about leaning on the language of others. 
Like, let me understand the world through the language of others. That's plenty. And I think that's also what the work is doing and why it's often looking at repositories of all the language, all the things that revolve around this one particular moment, this one particular event. Give me all the things and let me make sense of it. I don't actually have a desire to, to make new, slightly different. So that, that actually connects to another question that I have in thinking about the archive and a relationship to mapping geographies and how one's origin influences how we preserve, how we remember, um, how we consider memory. And so I'm curious about like the role of nostalgia for each of you in your practices and nostalgia means to return home. So as much as we're talking about the future, the whole essence of this archive is also this mindfulness of a past and how you are actively filling in a gap and being mindful of what needs to be preserved. So I don't know if, if you wanna speak, speak to that. I think the first thing that comes to mind for me when thinking about um, memory and nostalgia is just kind of my particular position in the, my family. So my father is the youngest of 11 siblings and I am, you know, the last born of my generation. Um, and so there's a way in which really quickly I become, I'm the same generation as people who are much older than me. And so I think I always had a sense of kind of listening to the past and of, you know, hearing the stories um, and trying to kind of absorb um, these memories and these stories that were passed down. I always felt like I was sort of like an interloper into a different generation and kind of connecting the generations that come next. So like most of my cousins who are my generation have children who are older than me, if that makes sense. And so I think a couple things happened where one, I was just always kind of um, a little shy and very like content to hang out on the outskirts of like, you know, a li family living room um, where all of these amazing stories are unfolding and just feeling like I want to capture these stories, whether it's through photograph or through, you know, writing things down and remembering next time, hey, you know, can you tell that story about this or that? Um, and so I think kind of just that being that collector, I guess, in a way, an observer and a witness is probably why I was already kind of primed to think about my family and think about historicizing my family and documenting my family even before you know this particular archive of the FBI file which is the sort of destructive version of that you know landed um, in my family and in, and in my practice but yeah I think it's I think it's those living room stories that is where it kind of starts from for me. Mm. Yeah, nostalgia. Um, well, so, right. I heard someone say, I think it was on NPR, it was again right after 2016, that like in times of crisis, we turn towards home. And if we can't do it in our bodies, we at least do it in our minds. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking a lot about Alabama um, right after the election. But I'm not go. I know I'm not moving back home. It's um, when home is a site that is equally as complicated as the other thing you're trying to escape, mm -hmm. right? It's a strange position, and your ideas of home or your memory of home is also complicated by a kind of, um, you know, where the landscape is like equally as beautiful as it is terrifying. So instead, I started working on a series. Um, it was based on choreography, the language of flowers and interpreting or translating all of the state flowers for the American South, and then pairing them with states where, for first, where my family left the South in the second wave of the Great Migration. So the Alabama's camellia means nostalgia. My destiny is in your hands, right? It has that incredibly Victorian romantic language of the 19th century. My destiny is in your hands. Illinois, I think, is the, um, let me not lie, because I'm forgetting now, but the translation is, let me go. It's like, welcome me, let me go. 
Louisiana's iris means I burn for you. Delaware, I am your captive. And there's a really, I think that became for me a way to talk about those feelings of home, of like wanting to return to something that doesn't feel safe. It feels equally as unsafe as the rest of the country, the rest of this place. Um, and yet it also has this incredible emotional attachment, beautiful and treacherous. My destiny is in your hands, let me go. I am your captive. It started to, you know, it's like American history through the landscape, through translating the flowers of this place. <laughs> That just, wow, that, that hit deep. I'm also, I'm, I'm from Alabama, which I mentioned in our meeting before. So that has, yes, the particular residency, but also thinking about love songs, which also feels like the role of love in the archive and for each of you, how that, that the role of that and the, the, the preservation is in part because of the, the urgency or the, or the importance of, of something that otherwise would not be valued to the degree that, um, we know that it is and, um, and should be for future. Um, yeah. But Stephanie, I, didn't, I don't know if you want to speak to nostalgia. Um, what Bethany said was so beautiful. Um, I, uh, I don't know that I have a, um, I don't know that I have a strong relationship to nostalgia in my work, but I do. I, one of the things that I was thinking about a lot as I was watching Bethany and Sadie's um, presentations has to do with um, what it means to use, um, um, I don't like decomposition kind of as a strategy, and um, what it means to begin with something whole um, and um, and and allow it to 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 turn into pieces, or allow it to to shift, or allow it to change or allowed to be remade anew. And so I was thinking um, maybe not so much about nostalgia specifically, but about what it means to be um, what I guess um, um, Fred Moten is called improvisatory of foundations, like what it means to have a relationship to your roots or your past, um, but um, but an, an improvisatory relationship to, to those materials, like to be attached to those materials and also um, recognize the need um, um, to um, to to make them make them change, make them strange, make them different. Um, the other the other thing I was thinking about a little bit was um, uh, oh I it, I just left. When it comes back, I'll say it again. Thank you. Does any do we want to elaborate on love? I feel like I go to so many panel discussions and it always comes back to love and all the, the complicated manifestations that it is of platonic, romantic, um, familial, um, communal. When, so I just remembered the other thing I was gonna say and I think it's sort of connected to love. <laughs> um, I was, um, and it's also, and it's, and it's also, but I think it's also connected to nostalgia. Um, and it was to quote, as I've sometimes quoted before, um, what um, Huey P. Newton has um, has um, uh, often said, um, which was to quote Nietzsche, um, which is to describe an arrow, like to invoke an arrow of longing for another shore as a way to describe revolution. And I think a lot about um, what it means, um, the ways in which longing, I, I, when I was in high school, one of the very first academic books I ever bought for myself when I thought that that was going to be an exciting way of learning things um, was this book called *The Longing for Total Revolution*, and it was a and and the book all it, it contained like a, a um, an account of how um, it's actually the longing for revolution, like a kind of desire for political change that animates all political change. And um, I think so much about 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 that desire, um, the desire for something that we ha we that maybe we haven't experienced, but it's it's within our grasp grasp to imagine it. And, um, and I think about how that desire could, can be, um, it feels like it has a kinship um, with love. It's an affective relation. We have an affective relation to the political future that we want to see, even if we can't quite feel it or describe it. Sadie, I didn't want to step on your, were you about to say something? No. I mean, I was just um, gonna say, I, yeah. I love that. <laughs> but you go in. 
Yeah, I like this idea. I mean, when you say love, it like shuts my brain down because I'm thinking, what do I make about love? But it is, you know, part of the thinking about it as longing for something is easier for me to grasp. Maybe it's easier for me to say. But part of the reason for making the the hymnal was, um, so I grew up in a really progressive Presbyterian church, but in Montgomery, Alabama, so super conservative. Um, but one of the things they would do was um, every year, annually, there would be a 48 hour, 72 hour Bible reading. And so you'd sign up for your hour, day or night, like 3 a.m. You go to the pulpit and you read from the text and you hope at 4 a.m. that the person who's supposed to relieve you like didn't forget their sign up sheet or you just keep reading. Usually there's nobody in the pew listening. And yet from home, you just like know that this, they do this with the Odyssey too, that this sacred text, a sacred text is worthy of being spoken back into the world, even if no one is listening. That feels a lot of like this moment for me. It's one of the reasons for making the hymnal. Like even if we can't sing it, even if we are not on the same page because we rarely are and rarely have been, it's still worthy of being sung back into the world. That like longing, that loss and longing and, and love feels all wrapped up together. Yeah. I think too, one of the things that I, you know, kind of found validation and I got excited about thinking about the longing is like kind of framing it in that way, like, it sort of, um, it says that perhaps the longing is enough, that the desire is enough, is valid, you know, not necessarily to get you to, you know, the like future vision abolition, you know, that we have, but that longing, that desire, that attempt is enough to put you one step, you know, one step and another step and another step and another step. And I think that in my work, that's sort of what these roses or these Hello Kitties are doing, it's like, of course, it's not enough. You know, it's not reparations for families that, you know, were torn apart because of COINTELPRO. It's not, you know, getting um, our elders out of prison who are still incarcerated, you know, for their activism, even as we celebrate the Black Panthers and 50th anniversaries and films and documentaries. It's not, but it's a desire to, you know, it's evidence of the desire to to heal and it's kind of a, maybe an acknowledgement of, you know, of course, something as simple as like a, you know, design of a flower isn't, isn't gonna do that, but it's the evidence of that longing and it's kind of following that, that longing and knowing and believing that it's, um, that that desire is, is strong and powerful. And um, so I think that's, that's what allows it to feel like a journey and a continuum and um, to feel important, even if you can't exactly quantify, um, which I think, you know, as artists, we sometimes have the privilege of being able to work in these slipperier spaces where we don't have to quantify and say, you know, to our members, like, this is what we're working on this week, this is the campaign, but allowing for that kind of longer longing. Just want to kind of sit in that. Um, and I guess connecting to longing is being like a vessel and being um, a conduit for that. And so thinking about what we hold and the role of, of the gesture. And so thinking about the archive as subjective, but as objective too. And then each of your respective bodies um, and the role that your body plays in this work um, and making the work. And then the double weight of the weight of the archive and, and the load bearing that um, comes into that. So I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. The load bearing aspect is so interesting. Um, I remember, so I, um, a different collaborative 
um, like ongoing collaborative body of work I have made is with the artist Jamal Cyrus called, and it's called Alpha's Bet is Not Over Yet. And I remember, so this work, um, we exhibited it once at um, the New Museum. It consists of a um, collection of um, uh, reproductions of uh, early 20th century uh, periodicals published by and for um, Black uh, readers and writers. And we invited a bunch of people to come and speak in relation to this um, to this um, particular version of the exhibition. And I remember that um, one of the people we invited to speak was Hilton Alls um, and, uh, and his, his friend Sharifa Rhodes Pitts. And Hilton, um, he walked in and the first, and the, the very first thing he said is, um, well, the first thing he said was like, this, this image on the cover of this periodical, this magazine is like my first lover's first lover. That was the first thing he said. And then the second thing he said was, I can't, I can't believe that you care. Like he said, it makes me sad that you, 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 Stephanie, you and Jamal carry the burden of feeling the need to make this installation. And I was actually, at the time I was like really crushed. I was like, wow, this is like my hero. And he's saying this thing that is, um, really a real challenge to this project. Um, and then I, um, as I, as I sort of thought it over, over time, I, I began to recognize that actually what he was describing is not, um, he wasn't saying that it wasn't necessary. He was acknowledging the burden. Um, and, 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 and it is one, and it's something, it's something that I think about a lot. I think about even now, um, I'll stop there. Yeah, it used to be really important to me um, to rewrite a thing in order to like make it physically manifest. And there was also another imposed limitation because the work is, at least the noise series, that small text series is abstracted, that it can go on forever. It has no kind of natural death to it. And so my imposed limitation was that I would write it until my hand hurt. And that idea of pain is like validating the labor and the piece, and also that it becomes man, like I own it, and I become master of this language, holder of this language. That all felt really important. That that feels like it's slipping away. And what I want is something more that the songs do, um, which is happening in Stephanie's work, is that language is transformed in the body it's all internal and that pain doesn't become a necessity in order for the language to like exist in another realm or to transcend its origin. Um, but that can all happen internally. And when it comes, you know, when it emerges again, it is now different than its source or different, it, 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 it's transcended. You've repeated it so many times that it's kind of divorced itself from original meaning and has become something, it's loosed itself, uh, yeah. I think when I'm thinking about a sort of burden, a weight, a caring, I think about, you know, the word inheritance, which is not specific to the good or the bad things that we inherit, right? So like we can inherit trauma. Um, some of us inherit wealth, um, but it's, it's kind of yours to do something with just in the way that you are, you know, of and in your time. And I, feel it's kind of, you know, your responsibility to engage with your moment and your time. I think um, in particular, the way that this work came to me, that this archive came to me, um, it wasn't that I was, you know, looking for a project that was based on an archive, you know, the archive or archival wasn't even necessarily a part of my language um, until, the, you know, this project kind of hit me in the face and it was really my father's desire to file a Freedom of Information Act request and to know what his, you know, personal experience with informants and his personal, you know, um, to see the personal details of his life and see what had been captured under this surveillance. Um, but to me, it felt like an inheritance. It felt like, um, you know, a responsibility um, to to do something with this with this information and. Um, of course, there are moments of it that were painful, and then there are moments um, where 
I feel small and there's moments where I feel big and victorious. Um, you know, there's, I think one of the most joyous moments for me was um, someone asked my father at one of the museum installations. Um, I think it was at the Oakland Museum where um, the FBI works were first on view, you know, asked him what it felt like to see all of these pages, you know, splashed against a, um, you know, somewhat public wall. And he said that it made him feel free. And for me, you know, that was basically enough. Like if I can make my father, you know, for one moment in this country feel free, um, then, you know, that's worth the weight and any burdens and any, you know, failings and flailings with this project and with the history that it, you know, comes from. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Whew, um, I need to like breathe more during, during this. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions shortly. I have a few more um, and we might weave, weave in, but um, I'd written this question before and I, I love the fact that in the presentations it became even deeper. So in her interview with um, Angela Davis, the Angela Davis Collection archivist, Lisbeth Telefson, curator Donna Gustafson asked, is there a space for silence in the archive? And then Bethany, I'm thinking about doing your presentation, the sharing of black noise as silence, which is something I've actually been thinking about for quite some time. Um, but then it's also in an earlier conversation we had with you, Stephanie, this question of challenging repair recovery. And so how does silence then exist within the space of the in-between? If that makes sense as a, a question to explore. I guess I can start. Um, I um, I am um, very interested in silence and all of the corollary words and related words, um, quiet and um, what it means. Yeah, what it means to withdraw. What it you know what it means to refuse repair. Um, what it means to um, what it means to um, to um, you, I, you know, speaking speaking very candidly, um, I myself sometimes um, wonder if if the very idea of repair or reparation isn't isn't like weirdly optimistic. Like, if only we did this, then somehow we could erase that. Um, when when um, I know that I'm. Um, I'm simplifying. I'm speaking very crudely, but um, but sometimes I, I I wonder about the the impossibility of repair, and um, I'm certainly very interested in repair as like an engine, or um, a, um, again as like maybe something that can be activated um, as a desire, but um, maybe not so much as a. Um, I don't know that there's. I I, I can't imagine um, how it how we could arrive at it, um, and. Um, I'm going to actually make another point that's a little, a little bit different, but I, I, I'm really interested in this question of silence in, in um, relation to the historical materials um, that I uh, often draw from in my work and that some um, that that's that you, Sadie and Bethany draw from in the work, the way that the material like that it speaks and also the, the many ways in which it actually doesn't doesn't say all, everything that we might want it to say, like what why, you know, the, the, the reasons that we add or, um, you know, recompose or decompose in order to, um, in order to um, amplify maybe what it wasn't loud enough or to sort of um, revisit something that um, was um, somehow wasn't able to like, the sustain wasn't long enough or something. So I, I think um, um, I, in my own work, I have a very conflicted relationship to um, the impulse to like the impulse to amplify um, or the um, because because it, there is a way in which it sometimes feel, it feels like it collapses into some kind of reparative 
reparatory possibility, which I'm not sure that I believe in. Um, but I also think that those, those are precisely the kinds of tensions that are really animating for me as an artist and intellectually. And, you know, I think about those and, and they help me. Um, I, I, yeah, I would say that, um, and in relation, I was really excited also about um, Sadie's work with noise. And um, I, I think I was thinking about the, the kind of signal noise relationship a little bit as I was listening to you, um, the other presentations and um, all of different ways in which the body or in which a machine or um, all the different all of the different kinds of um, like interruption and friction and also the di the impossibility of sometimes distinguish distinguishing between signal and noise like the, the ways in which the noise actually can sometimes be the the thing um, so like all the different ways in which um, as artistic strategies um, the two of you are um, redirecting attention um, like what it means to take the noise um, to, to take to take the noise seriously to consider the noise as a as a kind of subject um, and um, to and that forces us to reframe to rethink also um, conventions around um, like a binary between legibility and illegibility for example um, like um, the idea that some materials are can be read and others cannot some art can be understood and others cannot um, and to kind of re um, route those kinds of questions by thinking about them in relation to, um, 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 well, by thinking about the ideological implications and um, by thinking about them in relation to attention. And so I was really interested in that and um, Sadie and Bethany and both of um, your presentations and it invited me to think about new, think about threads in my own work differently. I think very briefly what I think of as, when I think about silence um, in relation to these FBI drawings, I think the redactions really um, feel like a type of silence, a type of silencing, but it's like very much not a neutral silence or just an empty silence. Um, it's very much like a pause holding place for that which, you know, even after these documents are declassified to some degree, I'm still not allowed to know. And the kind of um, sometimes arbitrary nature of what gets redacted and how and when, you know, I've heard that if you file a FOIA for the same document multiple times, you'll get different redactions. So there is like this, you know, um, it's, you know, there's some randomness and some like, um, subjectiveness to it, but I definitely think about those boxes as a, a type of, um, you know, loud silence. And there's a lot of silence in this discussion, which I also really appreciate, <laughs> and I feel like doesn't Thank happen you. a lot of times with Zoom is like, okay, got to keep it moving, but I think, um, just sort of the nature of our practices and personalities and the nature of this conversation were allowing for some, fit, some sitting and some thinking and some breathing. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, yes, I tend to agree. The silence is never actually, it's never actually pure silence. Like that's a impossible kind of conceit. It's, you know, sometimes it's about the, the gap in the archive. Didn't, in that lovely essay that you sent us, I think uh, Renee calls it the archival lacuna, the holes and the gaps and the things that have been purposely withheld. Sometimes it's about that and pointing to this, you know, it's nowhere in the Birmingham news pieces is it actually show you what, I'm sorry, it's the hair, show you what the work is about. Like nowhere is it is it made legible for you the information that's missing is still withheld. It just has to be understood through these like hints of the year and the, the place, um, like maybe you know it. It's never given, it's all withheld. It continues to be withheld. I think that's interesting. Um, but then other times that lacuna is about, it is about my own withholding, like the, that making that the songs illegible or reprinting uh, with a blind emboss process it creates a kind of haunting, right? A language that is there and it is not there at the same time. And it continues to haunt. 
or it's made illegible and refuses to be sung and therefore like refuses the original, its original mission. And that feels for me like a kind of uh, transfer of control from the original owner of the language to, my, to myself. Um, it's never pure silence, but it does act in these other kind of mysterious ways. Honoring the silence. Um, we have a few questions from the, the chat. Um, I still have a few more, but let's start with, I wanna ensure that we get some audience participation. So one question that came up is, I'm wondering about the shift in the importance of the living room conversations that Sadie mentioned, um, when I see slowly disappearing as that generation fades, what new form of a black archive do you all see developing from this generation who focuses so much on photo media? Does this hold the same weight as the oral tradition of sharing history archives? That's such a good question. I definitely don't know the answer. Um, I do feel like our, you know, generation's version of that is like definitely through memes and like through Black Twitter. And I personally, it's not the way, I'm just not that good at the internet. It overwhelms me and I can't see anything because I see everything sometimes. Although there could just be one meme that just makes you like, oh, the whole internet is worth it because of this whole one meme. So I, I go back and forth and I, I don't, you know, think it's for me to judge like the tools of any generation, but I definitely do, um, I definitely do miss, you know, the previous generation. I mean, of my father's 11 siblings, he's the last one remaining, he's the last one left and um, I, you know, I miss the people, like not just conceptually, I miss like, you know, the textures of those conversations. And I think um, what, I think, you know, another part of the, my project is to elevate the family archive to being just as important as this, you know, like government archive, right? And so the family photographs, the blurry photographs, you know, the double exposures, all the um, just stuff of the family you know, whenever I'm showing these FBI works, there's usually also like the piece at um, the Zimmerly, there's a wallpaper behind that shows like my little cousin sitting in like one of these, you know, peacock chairs or what I call like, we think of as the Huey Newton chair from the iconic photograph of him sitting in the chair with the spear and the rifle. And, but it's a little, instead of Huey Newton, it's my little cousin in like footy pajamas with a Captain America pajama set sitting in this chair. And so I'm always thinking about the real life family moments that happen alongside and behind these iconic moments. And so trying to think of, yeah, those family photo albums as um, and just as an important archive to elevate and, and to hold up and what that archive looks like for future generations. Yeah, it's, it's different for sure. Um, but I guess I have faith in, you know, faith in the culture that we're gonna figure out ways to, to take care of it. Um, in like long and short term, term ways, but it's a great question. Thanks, Sadie. Bethany or Stephanie, do you wanna add anything to that? It feels like a question for somebody younger than me. Um, Cause I'm still like, I'm still looking at, my stuff is 50s to 80s, you know, 1950s to the 80s, that feels personal. Those are all my dictionaries are from that that moment and then 19th century archives, you know, that's my jam. I need to be able to touch the thing where we're losing the kind of physical, the necessity of the physical archive or maybe the young, I don't know. It doesn't feel like my question. Hmm? Fair enough, fair enough. Um, mindful of time, I, there's one more question and I, I, I like the idea of ending on this because it ends on this ongoing process. Um, and maybe on an up. It's a question to Stephanie, but I, I do think, I think all of you, I want all of you to respond in your respective ways. Um, but starting with Stephanie, could you say something about the idea of quest as it might relate to archives, to activation and the future? The libretto, this is a quest we must begin and the lyrics of Young, Gifted and Black. Yours is a quest that's just begun. 
So to all of you, the best. That's such a beautiful question. Um, it gave me a uh, pause there for a moment. There's um, so much, so so much to think about. Um, I was thinking about the relationship between quest and question, <laughs> um, and the ways in which they both imply um, like a a, um, a a journey or an invitation or a proposition that's unfinished and. Um, the ways in which that the unfinished that unfinishedness is um, itself the um, um, the 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 kind of um, like the ongoing renewal and the ongoing invitation and what enables us to continue to to make it's like the challenge um, is actually to behold and um, and to um, work with and through and find comfort in um, that that kind of space of um, of, of, of of the unfinished um, and that space of kind of suspension there's there earlier Bethany used the word faith several times and I think so much about just like the 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 kind of constant leap leaps of faith that we take as artists um, and as um, I mean not just as artists but in particular I think about it in relation um, in relation to art, the ways in which we um, you 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 kind of make something and you offer it and you have no idea what will happen. Um, you start something and you have no idea where it will end. Um, and um, and yet we if we use the word leap of faith, not leap of like doom. <laughs> we have um, like an underlying um, under underlying um, belief that um, in the in um, and kind of trust in in ourselves and in the world and um, I um, and that trust um, underneath is something that um, the notion of quest or um, question or this kind of suspension um, also um, um, produces for me the the Newton's arrow um, arrow of longing for another shore um, the that kind of trust in the the destination even if it's differed I wish we could end on that one um, but if I must answer that question um, I've been thinking about Teju Cole had an interview. That's a while ago now, but it's still it's still sitting with me. With Krista Tippett, her On Being podcast. So it's about like what do we believe in these really loose definitions of belief, or broad like open definitions of belief. And Cole mentions uh, that he has like since childhood he's like left the creed behind, whatever he believed in his childhood, left the theology behind, but he's held on to the, the rituals of his childhood. Um, and that because we all need a lot of help, where he finds that help is in um, the language of our many spiritual and religious traditions, in poetry, and in the Odyssey, in Homer. Like that's where the help can be found in language that has been boiled down to its most quintessential form over time, which is essentially, I think, what we're all doing. It's like trying to find the the essence of language still, or for this moment, or for the future. But he keeps the rituals. Let everything else go and keep the rituals because there's something still, um, there's something still, it's like that idea, that question about nostalgia, that idea of home. Like though we can't go home again, the idea of it still has to be kept somewhere. And it, it, for me, it, it is a kind of way to think about what propels the work and what makes it worth it to keep working, making work for the world. Mm. Yes, I second all of that. I literally was like, Stephanie, can you like type that up? And can I have that as a 
as an answer to like almost every question, right? But um, I guess just very shortly, I think the quest has something to do with, you know, believing in the work enough to keep doing it and troubling it enough to keep iterating it and keep learning and responding and being gentle to oneself throughout both of those processes. Thanks, y'all. This was, I feel so full. Um, and I'm just so, gr oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, I just feel so grateful that I had this opportunity to share um, such generous and personal um, and considered um, time with you today. Um, once again, I'd like to thank everyone at the Zimmerly, um, the organizers of the Angela Davis's um, this time exhibit. If you can make it to Jersey, please do. There is still one more um, program within the series that I know there's going to be in the chat um, information to register for that. I hope you do. Um, thank you again, Bethany, Stephanie, and Sadie. To all of y'all, I hope you have a great afternoon, evening, morning still, weekend, um, and keep doing the work because it's, uh, it's necessary. So thank you.